To understand why the Bernoulli equation will kill you, you have to see what it's made of. And to do this, we begin with the energy balance equation. The energy balance equation tells you all that can happen to the different forms of energy as the fluid transits through the control volume. This equation here is valid for two conditions. One is that the flow is steady, which means if you, as you take different pictures of the flow at different time intervals, all the pictures are the same. And the second condition is that the control volume is not inflating or deflating. Okay? But otherwise, this is always true. Um, and this equation tells us everything can happen to the different forms of energy. Let's take a look. You have here on the left, the power added from outside as heat, the power added from outside as work. And on the right side, you have the difference between the inlet and the outlet in terms of energy flow. And energy can take different forms inside the inlet and inside the outlet. Um, here you have the mass flow and in the parentheses here, you have a sum of different terms. And these terms are the internal energy, which is carried as heat, goes to increased temperature inside the flow, inside the fluid, pressure divided by density, kinetic energy, one half of V squared, and then GZ, which is altitude potential energy, Z being positive, positive upwards. So these are the different forms of energy at inlet, and then you have the same forms at outlet. This is super good because we can see all the different shapes that energy can take um, at the inlet and the outlet. And we can see all the different exchanges that can happen in between the inlet and the outlet. The problem with this equation is that it has a lot of terms. Now let's count. You have here at the inlet, one, two, three, four, five. Then you have five more at the outlet. And then you have those two here, which are the net transfers from the outside. So that's 12 terms. If you are looking for one value in there, you need to put in 11 other values. And so this is quite a lot of frustration for fluid dynamicists. And so it's tempting to take this equation and then remove everything you don't like about it. Yeah. So what you would do then is you just take all the things that you feel uncomfortable with in this equation and you just remove them uh, from the equation. If you did this, you would make this equation pretty useless and you would land on the Bernoulli equation. The Bernoulli equation is an energy balance equation that has additional restrictions to it. And what, what are these restrictions? You have first steady flow, and that's fair enough because we started with steady flow already. Yeah, we had this already in the steady flow energy equation before, so that's fine. Added restriction is incompressible flow, and this means that rho remains constant. Another added restriction is that there is no heat and no work transfer. So the two terms on the left side of the equation, those two terms go away. There's no friction, because why would you want to have friction? Without friction, it's pretty nice. No heat transfer, no heat power, no friction. It means I, the term of the internal energy, this remains constant as the fluid flows. And finally, you have only one dimensional flow, which means you only have one inlet, one outlet, and you are certain the flow goes from the inlet to the outlet. It follows only one line in between those two, uh, those two places. If you add all those restrictions, um, then that equation, which we had before, becomes just this equation now here. And you have zero on the left term, on the left side, sorry. And then on the inside, you have this I becomes a constant, is the same between the inlet and the outlet. P may change, but rho does not change. And then you have kinetic energy and potential energy. And so this gives us a very, very well-known result, which is the Bernoulli equation, which tells you pressure plus one half of rho v squared plus rho gz. This is the sum of that, that's one number. And if you go at the outlet of your control volume, then it is equal to the same number. The sum of those terms is equal to the same number. Yeah? And this describes the flow of one particle in a steady, incompressible, frictionless flow with no energy transfer. So very, 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 very restrictive. Let's have a look at what this means now in practice. Huh? It's enough for the math. Let's have a look at what it means for the engineer in practice. First constriction, um, a restriction of steady flow, um, is okay. It prevents you from doing things like studying flow in the veins um, inside the human body, um, where the heart would just pump uh, the flow and give some unsteadiness to the flow. Yeah? So no transit effect, no unsteadiness. 
but that's still fair enough. Second restriction is restriction of incompressible flow. And there are two, two things with it. One is that you cannot go extremely fast. So you cannot have compressible flow, means you cannot have high Mach numbers of Mach 0.5, Mach 0.6. So typically in air, you are limited to 500 kilometers an hour, approximately. And that's fair enough, because most flows of practical interest have low speeds. But you also cannot have any compressor, uh, no turbine, no diffuser, no nozzle, no rocket engine, nothing where the fluid will um, store energy and expand energy as internal compression effects. So that's quite a big restriction. Third restriction is no heat and no work transfer. Okay, so no machine of any kind. Yes, no pump, no turbine, no combustion chamber, no cooler, no hair dryer, nothing that adds or subtracts energy to the flow will work with the Bernoulli equation. Okay, fourth restriction is no friction. <laughs> and this is quite astonishing, to be honest. Uh, no turbulence, no shear, no viscous effects. The flow just glides along in one perfect, steady, smooth way throughout your control volume. Now that's quite a large restriction in engineering. Um, uh, one implication of this is that you cannot come close to any object. So every time you have a steady fixed object with a flow going around it, um, near the skin of that solid object, um, the velocity is zero. And so the, as the fluid goes over it, there is a lot of shear. There's a shear layer, which we call the, call the boundary layer, um, that applies around the skin of that object. So the Bernoulli equation does not apply anywhere close to objects because of that shear layer over here. And the fifth restriction is that it's one dimensional flow. So you need to be certain that the particle goes at the inlet is also the same particle that will go at the outlet and that it follows a, a line in between those two. You cannot predict what is going to happen with the Bernoulli equation. Yeah? You cannot use it to predict what the flow will be you have to observe only one certain given flow that is in front of your eyes, and then it will work. Okay, so, so much for the talking and all the lists of things why it will not be very, very useful for engineers. Now let's take a look at a practical example. Let's say you are going to the airport and you're sitting there in the grass, it's summer day, and you see airplanes flying about. And this is a very standard airplane. This is a Dash 8 uh, commuter airplane. Uh, this is a machine that's based entirely on fluid mechanics, yes? Uh, so you see this airplane, you snap a picture, and then you ask yourself, where can I use a Bernoulli equation um, around this machine to predict how it works in general? Well, let's take a look. First, you can't use a Bernoulli equation inside the engine. So there's a compressor, there's um, combustion chambers, turbines, um, exhaust, nozzles, all those things in there. Um, add and subtract energy to the flow and have very compressible um, flow in there. So no Bernoulli equation in here. Those engines will emit a plume of hot air, which will dissipate. And this plume is very turbulent, so lots of shear in there. And it also um, loses a lot of heat to the atmosphere. So no Bernoulli in that zone either. You can't come close to the propellers, because propellers add energy to the flow, a great deal of it. And so don't come any close, uh, anywhere close to the blades of the propeller. Once the propellers have swept, uh, turned the flow and pushed it backwards, the flow will um, transform into one big rotating cylinder of very turbulent air. So you cannot go into there um, and apply the Bernoulli equation. This is a dead zone for the Bernoulli equation in the, in the wake of those propellers. Okay. Um, remember that next to solid surfaces, the velocity is zero, so there's a loss of shear next to surfaces, so you don't want to come close to the skin of the airplane. Anywhere close to the airplane, lots of shear, no burning equation. And finally, all this shear will just be trailed away behind the airplane into one very turbulent, very messy, very dissipative sheet of air that just follows um, behind the airplane. And so the burning equation does not apply there either. So where can you use the Bernoulli equation? Where I guess I found a couple of places uh, around the airplane where I guess it could work as long as you don't come close to anything interesting, then the Bernoulli equation will apply. Yeah? So stay safe and be very careful with this equation when you use it. In fact, you will find if you just play with a hose and try to reduce the area and you play with a velocity 
of the water coming out of a hose of water. Um, you try to predict this with the Bernoulli equation, you will fall flat um, on your face. Uh, Bernoulli equation will predict the same outlet velocity regardless of the outlet area. So play a bit with this equation and see it's, uh, and beware of its limitations before you use it. Now, a lot of people come to me then and say, well, Olivier, uh, obviously you use the Bernoulli equation without losses, but I use a special version where I take into account everything that you're talking about and I take it, this into account as one additional term here called delta P loss. And this makes the equation true. Um, and I agree, it's magic. Um, very nice, good for you. Um, if I told you uh, that two plus three is equal to four and you would kind of look at this and doubt and, and tell me about pretty sure this is not true. And I would then tell you, oh, of course, yeah, yeah. Um, you just have to add a delta P loss over here to make the equation true. Uh, then certainly you would feel like, like that's magic. Yeah, well, it's just one added term on top of this. We will use the Bernoulli equation with losses in very specific cases. And in those cases, we are under control of what happens inside our flow. Yeah, namely those cases are uh, flow inside pipes. And we can calculate this delta P loss um, using interpolation tables, using experiment data um, very well. And so it is useful in practice. But do not go about studying the flow around an airplane um, and then guessing the value of this delta P loss. You will get completely wrong results. So before you use the Bernoulli equation, are you sure that the five conditions apply? If you cannot remember those five conditions, just don't use it. Go back to the energy equation. Um, if you have a delta P loss term that you add in there, are you sure that this delta P loss can be um, predicted uh, very well, safely, yeah, very predictably? Or are you just guessing the value of this delta P loss? Because if any of those two conditions are not met, then just go back to the energy equation. It will force you to question your choices. It will force you to cross out terms and wonder, is really the internal energy the same as the inlet in the inlet as at, at the outlet? Um, and this will force you to question your assumptions about the flow. Now I'll finish with just um, historical information for fluid dynamics geeks who are wondering if the Bernoulli equation is so useless, then why do fluid dynamicists use it? Well, uh, Daniel Bernoulli wrote this equation and it's not his fault that the equation is useless. Um, Hydrodynamica, the book in which um, Daniel Bernoulli wrote this equation or suggested it in this equation, um, it was a seminal piece. It was the first time we really had a relationship between flow properties um, inside the fluid flow, not just in statics, but in, in the fluid flow. And that's quite, that was quite impressive. Uh, the concept of energy didn't show up for another century. Yeah? So uh, it's easy to say that the Bernoulli equation is just a simplified version of the energy equation, but the energy equation just came a lot, a lot later. Uh, and just finally, just for context, historical context, uh, it's easy to take a picture of an airplane and then cross out the zones where the Bernoulli equation doesn't apply. But there were no airplanes in 1738. Yeah, the fastest thing on the planet over there uh, at that time was a horse. Yeah, so this is for context. And just for the the nerds, I will show you the cover page of that book, uh, Hydrodynamica, 1738. I just read the title and the subtitle to you because I think this sounds just so cool. This is Hydrodynamica. Yeah. Sive de viribus et motibus fluidorum commentari opus academicum ab octore dum petropoli agaret congestum. How cool does this sound? Yeah. Um, I was thinking about putting such a title like this on my PG thesis, but I think I'm really just chickening out of this. Um, so again, coming back to the start, to this energy equation here. This is safe to use. There are lots of terms in there. If you don't have them all, do not worry and do not give in to the little voice uh, behind your, the back of your head that tells you, just use the Bernoulli equation because the Bernoulli equation will give you a very nice result that's easy to calculate and it's wrong. Yeah. So take care and see you later.